I think we are setting the scene over a very wide area, a very wide stage, and uh, the scene I'm setting is rather different from the first speaker, talking about uh, higher education, uh, particularly with respect to sustainability. But of course, the wall is a wonderful metaphor, and uh, it, it occurs all the time when you're thinking about how a university operates, whether it's to do with breaking down the barriers between disciplines, because the uh, modern uh, universities are tackling problems for which the traditional academic disciplines are hardly relevant as separate constructs. Uh, most of the big challenges require us to address issues across disciplines. And indeed, there used to be a notion that somehow universities were, as we say in English, ivory towers. They were totally distinct from society and the operation of society. Uh, they were like monasteries for thinking. Uh, th th that has long, those walls have long broken down, I would argue. Uh, and I think I have some examples that hopefully illustrate and explain that. But I do want to start off by saying that when you talk as a rector or as a vice chancellor of a university, you're always optimistic about sustainability. You cannot help but being optimistic about the future. When you're surrounded by enthusiastic young people, clever, bright researchers, who know no limits to the problems they can tackle, certainly will never acknowledge any limits to what's possible in terms of tackling challenge, problems, difficulties. So in that environment, one way or the other, we are always optimistic about finding ways through. A little bit uh, about the talk. I'm going to say a few words about Swansea University, our history and philosophy, just to give you a background and as the advertisement uh, element of the talk. Uh, and then into sustainable technologies, the way in which a university, a university, but you can generalize from this, can, can work with, with modern industry with quite a remarkable emphasis on sustainability in what's going on. Uh, so here's the advertisement. We, Swansea University, you may not all know about us, but uh, this year, the student vo vote itself voted us the uh, University of the Year title through the website What Uni. We've been shortlisted by the Times Higher for the University of the Year Award, which is our Oscars in the UK for universities. Uh, and we've got through some pretty good assessments in terms of what we do. And don't doubt our ambition. Uh, our approach is rooted in history. In fact, we were unusual because we were a university established nearly 100 years ago at the behest of industry. Industry wanted a university because uh, the area of Wales, where Swansea is, was heavily influenced by large industry, whether it's metallurgy, uh, whether it's mineral extraction, uh, whether it's coal, iron, steel, copper, at one point, Swansea was the world center of the copper industry where the world global price of copper was set. You won't know these things, but we know uh, that we, were, we, we work in a region which was built on heavy, ugly, dirty industry. Uh, and uh, what was very interesting 100 years ago is the industrial magnates who pushed to have a university said, we don't just want science and engineering, we want rounded people who can help support economic industrial growth. So we are a full service university with arts and humanities as important as science and engineering and medicine, but engineering is undoubtedly the strongest area in the university for that reason. And we have an approach of co-location. We have an approach of sharing facilities with companies. Uh, so again, no barriers here, no, no walls here. Uh, and uh, that enables us to work with industry beyond the type of frontiers research which academics normally do, right through to scaling up to commercialization and so on. Uh, and in those processes, new problems are, are, are hit. 
which can feed back into academic research. So working alongside the industrialists working on development and commercialization uh, means you get more flow of uh, challenging problems back to the research community in the university. Uh, we, we've gone through this process of, in a sense, reimagining uh, what economic sustainability is about from the legacy of the past to the, uh, to the type of, of industries of today. And uh, the copper heavy industry, steel, fossil fuels, uh, developed these strengths in metallurgy and engineering and related fields, but now they're being transferred into the high-tech operations uh, of, of, of today. And you can ask, well, you know, what possible role in sustainability could it have in developing a land vehicle uh, that is going to hopefully travel at a thousand miles an hour, where the, all the aerodynamics and the design is being done by scientists in Swansea University and will be out in South Africa next, next year trying to beat the world's land speed record. Well, the, the whole point is about its efficiency of design and it's the methods of engineering design which can be maximally efficient. So the same methods are also being used by Airbus. So Airbus planes are designed to be more efficient, burn less fuel, to be more effective as a result of the same software developed in Swansea University as being used for the, that, that car. Uh, I think one of the reasons I was nominated to come here was uh, because the European Investment Bank and the European Commission got very excited about a project we're engaged in in Swansea, uh, which is building a whole new campus, which is concerned with shared facilities with industry based around engineering and business, uh, on uh, where over half the funding for this 600 million euro project uh, which will be completed this time next year and fully operational this time next year, that, uh, that project, uh, half, over half that funding came from industry for, these for, the, for the development. Uh, and that's what it'll look like uh, with extensive uh, facilities for engineering business uh, and an energy safety research institute paid for by the UK government. I'm delighted to acknowledge uh, the huge amount of funding from the European Union as well for this, uh, for this project, something like 70 million euros uh, from uh, the European Commission for this. Uh, but going into the case studies, uh, the sort of things that give, give me some, uh, help to give us some confidence about the way in which science and engineering having broken down barriers of the industry, can begin to do some effective things. And this is one centre in our engineering college, which started off in the old tin plating days, but you'll see now printing and coating is no longer about heavy industry. It's much more sophisticated than that. And the examples uh, of forward innovation and application cover things like graphics and packaging, printed electronics, and medical and biotechnical printing. And uh, certainly, it, this is not uh, an area that many people are familiar with. The way in which the old printing industries have been replaced by new printing industry. In Europe, it's concentrated mainly in Germany, Italy, and the UK the way we can now print newspapers with flashing lights on them and flashing uh, headlines on them. We're within a few years of printing a television uh, on a sheet, uh, just using print te printing technology rather than separate components put on. So this means you can print areas the size of football pitches within a sort of 90 seconds. Uh, this, this, and using far fewer components and using simpler components and, and of course a lot of the research is using ubiquitous components rather than the very scarce materials that go into a lot of electronics these days. It's also about miniaturization. So by miniaturizing what, what one's doing, uh, you're uh, using l fewer resources and the, in the application, it's going to be more energy efficient. Now, these are some of the more traditional areas of application. 
uh, of, of, of printing. Uh, but uh, it, it begins to get exciting when it gets onto moving displays. Uh, rather than a dial moving, you can actually print it. Uh, and you know, even say a police sign, which is just on a printed onto a sheet, rather than a lot of LEDs stuck onto a, a, a sheet. But let's move on uh, into the very, very modern generation area. Uh, and here you are printing biological tests onto strips using, using printing machines. And again, being able to pour these components uh, off a printing press very, very cheaply. So in other words, all the biological uh, material and the chemical material is in the inks that go, which are printed on the sheets for, for mass production. Uh, and you can begin to see more and more sort of exciting areas of application here. Uh, the RFID, which, we, which is appearing on packaging everywhere now when you go to the supermarket and you put your goods through the reader, we're using an RFID tag. They require more packaging. We've actually, in order to be able to buy things simply and to have less time at the till, less, less uh, operation, op operator time at the till, uh, we've had to put more packaging on materials to contain the RFID tag. Now they're being printed uh, in see-through form, uh, which doesn't require any additional packaging. Uh, we can print microheaters. People are even talking about microheaters going into clothes. So the right parts of the bodies can be heated in different environments using the absolute minimum of heat. We've, uh, micro heaters are now being uh, incorporated in tests into buildings uh, so that particular parts of buildings are warmed at, the, at a sensible uh, rate depending on the use of different parts of the buildings. Uh, and again, you, using, so it isn't just minimum material for the, uh, for the, for the actual facility, but it's use of resource when it's operational as well. Uh, and we could go on and on giving uh, examples of these sort of things. Uh, what about in the health area? Well, you know, the 3D bioprinting is beginning to look extremely promising area and indeed, where we're actually building up a biological architecture with the structural complexity of real tissue using 3D printing, using the printing process. Uh, and uh, as an example here of building a new trachea, uh, artificially from biological material which will, can be transplanted uh, in due course uh, in, into an individual. And many body parts will, over the next few years, be developed that can be printed from biological material using exactly the same uh, processes. So this is a diff slightly different type of sustainability. Uh, this is about sustaining life, uh, but you'll find that uh, in research agendas, the, the, uh, the medical application area and the sort of sustainability agenda in, in, in using less resource and less energy, they do merge, and the, but they are two dominant agendas in, in huge areas of academic research. So there's a truck here. The other example I want to uh, quote is a major project that's currently underway on sustainable project engineering uh, for innovative functional industrial coatings. This, this is interesting, I think, because it does uh, break down the walls, to go back to that metaphor, between universities and companies. And it also brings in multinational companies uh, the key partners for this project are uh, Tata Steel, which of course is the Indian company, Pilkingtons, which is a UK company, BASF, which of course is a German company, uh, and they've all been in various ways relocating facilities and equipment uh, to Swansea uh, as part of this collaborative project uh, in, in order to uh, be, bring together the different scientific processes which can actually make functional steel. Steel is still an incredibly uh, cheap uh, uh, facility to make. If you want to mass produce something with, with strength, steel is a remarkably uh, a good material. To actually put coatings on the steel that can do things uh, transforms its uh, areas of application. Uh, and 
the sort of things that are, that are going on here uh, is using steel coatings as a photovoltaic effect. But these photovoltaics just are in the paint. Uh, and uh, so that how the, and most buildings are, uh, that, are, that go up are either covered in steel or, or glass. It's, those are the two dominant materials on the surface of buildings ac across Europe. Uh, steel and glass, both of those you can make functional uh, with the appropriate materials on them. Uh, and the, the challenge then is having generated electricity from the functional coatings, which are, can be a fraction of the cost of photovoltaics. D again, don't, can use ubiquitous materials rather than the specialized and, and scarce uh, minerals that have to be used for photovoltaics. The challenge then is how do you store that uh, energy? Usually you want it, the energy to be released at a different time to when you uh, generate it. Uh, and uh, there are various methods uh, which, which are being revisited actually in terms of storage uh, by different companies uh, and then releasing at the right time and the right efficiency. So the, this is the, put these three things together, generation, storage and release, you have buildings as power stations for themselves. And can you get to the point where major industrial buildings are totally self-sufficient uh, in energy? And we are moving direct, we're moving pretty close in that direction uh, to in, 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 uh, in reality. Uh, I mean, this is the other extreme of a very small pod, a self-sustaining sort of small office building, which is totally self-sustaining. This is just a test for the technologies. So uh, the, the electricity is generated using uh, the metal cladding uh, with the pigments on, uh, the energy is stored inside and released to be able to use it in, in that way. But we're able to scale this up to a much larger extent. I mean, the, the key points I'm making here is that if you look at the way in which university industrial collaboration is going, there is a, a, a dominant theme that keeps on coming through that it is about sustainability because the cost of energy and the cost of raw materials is driving industry to turn to universities again and again to be able to be, improve the sustainability of their products. I mean, they're improving profitability, but the way in which the cost structure is, it drives them to improve sustainability. And you, you must remember what the role of universities is when it comes to working with big companies. They've got plenty of engineers and scientists. They want universities to solve the problems the normal competent professional can't solve. They're coming to us for the difficult problems, the tricky problems. By co-locating, they get both. And they also actually get sourced to graduates to be able to recruit, to be able to have a sustainable flow of skills in their operation. But I hope I've given you some sort of taster of the way in which uh, the barriers around universities have long ago broken down. Uh, the barriers between universities and industry have progressively broken down. And uh, the examples I give in Swansea, many other universities could give similar examples in different fields. There's nothing particularly exceptional about those examples. But it, it's, it's a, it's, it is a very important a demonstration of the way in which the, uh, the science and engineering community is orientating its, it, itself uh, to be a, a positive, uh, to take a positive line with, uh, with, in the work that it's doing, being driven by, albeit by, uh, at times, the relatively short-term demands and requirements of industry to produce something that's really good, positive, and sustainable in the long run. So thank you very much for your attention.